Welcome to Your Money with Leo DiPrilli. I'm Leo DiPrilli, and each week on AM570, Dan Rivers and I will talk about anything and everything to do with your money. If you ever have questions, please feel free to call me at 330-533-6936, or you can email me at leo at gemyoung.com. Enjoy the show. This episode of Your Money with Leo DiPrilli is sponsored by Grange Insurance. Time now for Your Money, brought to you by Jim Young Wealth Advisors. You'll find them in Canfield. Just search Jim Young. Leo DiPrilli has been with me for many years. And today, the professor is in. You got it. Good morning, Dan. We're How are you today? We're going to learn something today, eh? Yeah, we're going to cover some things and tie a few things together, especially if you're younger. Some some concepts that I think will just help you through your life. I might... Um... I might take some notes. Does good that sound deal. good? Sounds good to me. We're, we invite your calls. Uh, we do that with Leo every Tuesday and try to give you some good information about what's going on in the world of finance, stuff that's current. But uh, it's always good to go back and take a look and see what are the basics. And that's kind of what we want to touch. And we're using an article by Suzanne McGee today and budgeting cash flow yield FICO scores, net worth, equity. Where do you want to start? I want to move around a little bit, Dan. Okay. I want to start with what I call good debt. Good debt. Good debt. For so many years, and, and this goes back to people that were raised by the Depression era people. So this is a multi generational um, concern many people have that they look at debt as bad. There is some bad debt, like credit card debt's bad debt. Okay. But there is some debt that's good debt. For instance, a home loan, if you have it structured right, you have the right interest rate. You know, you're, and, and, and a lot of people say once you have debt, do what you can to pay it off. I'm not one of those people in that camp. Mm -hmm. There's some debt you should keep and you should keep for a long time because you, you almost have to look at your money as an employee. Yes. Okay. And, and those employees have a job to do. And you want your em, employees working as efficiently as they can. And those uh, employees working on certificate of de deposits right now, they're not working very hard, are they? No, they're not. <laughs> and that's a good point because if people will look at what they're earning in the bank versus having debt, and they'll say, well, it's costing money to have debt, but if you invest smartly, you know, and you can earn a higher rate of return on your investments than you can on your debt, yeah. then you're better off to have the debt. So to, to feed that back to you, if you can get a mortgage loan that, is about two percent now? Is that is that what it would be? Two or I three? think it's around two and three quarters to three. So three three percent. So you're actually making a money on that because the house is is appreciating more than that interest, right? Right. So you're you're making more because well, I mean, and that, and don't take that to the bank because that could change. But right now, housing is up significantly. Right. You make the decision based on the information you have today. Mm -hmm. And that's what the situation is today. And the other thing about paid off houses, you know, houses are emotional assets. So if you have a paid off house, you can't really get to that money unless you're borrowing money back out again out of your house, which isn't always an appealing option. And you have to have some place to live. That's right. So having other investments, especially if those investments equal your debt, I like to tell my clients, if your investments are equaling your debt, you are theoretically debt free. You're just choosing to do other things with that money, that employee. Right. Okay. You're trying to just have that employee work better for you. So don't look at debt as bad. And, and, and based on the debt you have, don't be in a hurry to pay it off because the whole point of the, the, the end game we try to get to, and we talk about it all the time is that work optional lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So it's just like playing football, you know, to really get good at the game, you have to execute blocking and tackling. In other words, the base. Probably a lot of folks out there know it, but um, if you are in business, business debt can be good too. Absolutely, it can be good. So so look at the whole approach differently. Just take a whole different mindset to how you look at what your money is mm -hmm. and what your job is for your money. Yeah, and still you're very limited on where you can put money if you have a nest egg with temporary money, money that you're going to need in the next six months. There's not really a lot of places to put that right now, and a lot of folks are still sitting on the sideline with that money, which I think you're okay with that, right? Well, if you if, if you have to have short-term money, and we all do, and that's an important point to have some liquid money. Right. You just have to make peace. You're not going to earn anything on it. All right. If you'd like to talk to Leo DiPrilli, you can find him when you search Jim Young in Canfield. He's been helping thousands Excuse me, thousands of uh, listeners in our area for a long, long time, and a select customer out there that uh, really wants that concierge service. He provides that. Uh, let's move on to the next point. So it's some good debt. Good debt. Let's talk about credit and, and credit utilization rate. Here's a great story. Do you ever talk to somebody and they say to you, Dan, I just closed three credit cards I don't use anymore, and my credit score went 
down. Right? I have heard that. In other words, they're cleaning up there and saying, oh, I've got the Home Depot card. I don't need that any longer. i got the old Navy card. I don't need that. And they just cut them up and they cancel them. Right. And their credit score used to be 750 and now it's 720. What's going on? That's exactly right. That's it. Well, when the credit card companies look at you and when the credit uh, companies look at you, like Experian, right. they're looking at your capacity. So when you let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars of capacity of to be able to borrow money between all of your credit cards combined, okay, yeah. and let's say you were so to, that would be where you'd see the max on each card. That, that's correct, and you'd add them all up. Right. So that's your capacity to borrow. So let's say on an average month you spend three thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Well, you still have significant capacity. So they look at you and say, okay, for his capacity versus what he's spending. He's a very good credit risk. So the way you got that capacity is you've earned it. That's correct. Is that and so? So you you have the capacity for a hundred thousand dollars in debt. You've earned that, and now all of a sudden you've taken that down by twenty thousand, and now it's eighty. So now your capacity is eighty thousand, but you're still spending the same three thousand. Okay, but now your percentage of debt that you're using goes up, so that affects your credit score in a negative way. Hmm. Wow. Now, is there a way to um, to downsize on credit cards without hurting your overall credit score? There's no, there's no finance. There, there, it doesn't hurt you to leave them open. Okay, you're not going to get a statement from them, especially in today's digital world. Mm-hmm. So it just sits out there. So if there's no, there's no real compelling reason for me to say don't go through the exercise of closing them. Mm-hmm. Is it does it actually hurt you in the short run? Okay, so it. you're just saying don't once yeah. you once you acquire a credit card. Um, what if a credit card expires? Is that the same thing as closing it? Um, Are you sure? Or do you you want to punt on you that? You mean when the, when the date? So you've had credit cards, and um, they'll say that the credit card has expired and you don't renew it, and it takes an action on your part. That would be the same as closing it, wouldn't it? I, I my guess, I don't yeah. know. I would say it would. Yeah. If, if sometimes you don't they change it. numbers too, but uh, what you're basically saying. The smart money keeps these credit cards open, and you discipline yourself not to use them if you don't want to. It doesn't hurt not to use them, does it? No, it doesn't. Like I said, it's all about managing your your debt capacity Mm -hmm. and keeping that capacity in balance or keeping your debt to the debt you use versus the capacity you have uh, low. So, you know, one thing I'm taking away from this, and probably a lot of our listeners, um, be judicious in opening credit cards, right? You know, if you're going to go out and you're going to – Somebody offers you a credit card. Think about whether or not you need that. It doesn't seem to hurt, Dan. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's the capacity. The capacity. The only time I've seen capacity come into play is if you're going to buy a house, and the the bank will look at your capacity and say, "Well, you have the capacity of so much debt. We're only going to loan you so much money." So I have seen the capacity right. work against you because so- they feel you could go get that money and put their their note in danger. That's correct. Yeah. So I, I have seen situations where the bank has said, you need to close X amount of credit cards to reduce your capacity to this yeah. amount, then we'll loan you the money. Credit cards tend to still be high-value interest rates, don't they? I mean, not value, but high interest rates. Credit. Yeah, that's correct. And credit cards should be used as a tool, not a way to finance anything. Okay. Okay. I, I pay my credit card every month. I've raised my kids to pay the credit card every month. Because it's a tool where you where I'm floating using somebody else's money for thirty to thirty five days. Yeah. Do you use debit cards? I do not. I don't either. And uh, I think that you and I've been doing this show long enough to know that um, debit cards there's a lot more responsibility to them. Yeah, it's the it's the new way of cash, and there's and it's I just find putting everything on my credit card because I use the points credit cards. Yeah. So it's actually a disincentive for me to use a debit card because I don't get anything for that activity. All right. Back to my money being an employee. All right. Good my, information my, my on the credit, credit cards. cards. Another employee. Yep. Another employee. Let's let's move along to our next point. Okay. Always pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. You know, I see this especially if you have if you're listening, you have young children. Just beat this into their head. It's your money. You've earned it. You're the CEO of your life. Don't let because everybody every day is trying to convince you to yeah. have another payment, yeah. to buy something new. Look at how many times we're marketed to a day. Right. I used to do a, I used to teach a junior achievement class to some boardman students. And at that time, this is probably 10 years ago, the average 
uh, opportunities for someone to market to an individual on any given day is like 3,500. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it's much higher now. But there's 3,500 attempts to get you to either buy or do something mm-hmm. on a daily basis. How do you like to pay yourself first? What's the, give, give us a couple methods. Utopia is if you can add up and save at least 15% of your gross between what you save maybe in your 401k, what the employer match might be, plus your additional non-retirement savings. If you're, if you're young and in your 20s, and if you can get to saving that 15% of your gross, you're going to be working in your 50s because you choose to. John, got it. All right. Pay yourself first. Next point. Next point. Um, diversification. This is key. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I know this is, this is basic, but this is blocking and tackling. Make sure, especially if you're a younger person, you know, take, be more aggressive in your 401ks. Let your money, again, make that a higher performing employee, you know, but then go back to bucket, you know, your middle bucket for your more, maybe money you think you're going to need for retirement, but not sure yet. But make sure you have that built out differently than your retirement bucket because we, like we spoke of earlier, the other key factor that we have is we're not having any return on what our cash is right now. Mm-hmm. And again, even for young people out there that may have 40 years of earnings, uh, they, they're going to want to have some utility stocks, some things that are the basis of a, of a good portfolio. Then they're going to have some growth stocks. That's right. And then when, when to wrap this all together, you want to start talking about something we don't talk about much anymore is compound interest and compound rates of return. Yep. How money compounds over time. You know, it used to be the, we used to talk about the rule of 72. Yes. You know, the rule of 72 tells you, gives you an average of how quickly money will double. Well, if you're a young person, you know, you apply that rule of 72 to a 6% rate of return versus a 4% rate of return. By the time you get in your 60s, the difference in what you saved is hundreds yep. of thousands of dollars. And finally, I think I got it, didn't I? You got them all? Well, you know, finally, let's talk about, do you use this philosophy in managing money? I do. I most certainly do. All right. You know, we always start with liquidity because if we got to get, we got to get the liquidity down first because if we get the liquidity down, it lets people think longer. All right. Very well. Look, if you need somebody out there that can um, hold your hand during these financial times, He's the guy that can do it. Uh, he and his staff out there, they're a growing company. Gem Young Wealth Advisors, they're not for everybody. They've said that right up front. But they are for people out there that would like a good work optional lifestyle. That's right. And yeah. it's a lot of fun getting there. Yeah, and you help them do that. And it all begins with a, that initial meeting. What do you call that? We call that our fit meeting. It's I a, do that? Yeah, it's a non-committal uh, meeting. That's what I like the most about it. Everybody's free to talk and speak. And we, we don't make any decisions that day. Everybody goes home and thinks about it like I do with my team, and we decide whether we're a fit for them, and they decide whether uh, we're uh, a fit for them as well. So it's um, it's an, it's a good process. Yep. It's a fun process. And one thing when you're uh, moving money, changing financial advisors, be patient because these things take a while. It's not just up to Leo, but it's up to the people that may currently have your money oh, yeah. on how soon they're going to let go of it. it takes and they, their, their sometimes. feet drag a lot, don't they? They do. It takes perseverance to, to, to win that over sometimes. But we, right. we stay in the game till we get it done. You're going to work? I am. You're very good. Okay. And uh, give him 15 minutes to get to work and then call? That's right. You can call me at 330-533-6936. Or you can email me at leo at gemyoung.com. And uh, they've got great websites set up, and you can find out all about them when you search Jim Young Wealth Advisors there in Canfield. Until next week, my friend. Looking forward to it. Go, Go Penguins, Penguins huh? you, you got it. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell for notifications. And also make sure to connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For all of your business news, visit businessjournaldaily.com. For all of your arts and entertainment news, go to afterhoursyoungstown.com.